Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for April 1st, 2024. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is a community effort, but it's sponsored primarily by Adafruit. So if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server, you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. There is a pretty much constant talk about electronics topics in the discord, but this meeting is held in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel, usually on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes document, you can find a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app, which eases uh, checking time zones and things, especially if you're outside of the US. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications or you'd like to participate uh, in the voice meeting, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonista's Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps so you can skip around to the part of the video that interests you the most if you're watching it after the fact. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes, depending how many folks have uh, updates to share. And after each meeting, we post the link to the next meeting's notes in the CircuitPython dev channel of the Adafruit Discord. Just hit that pinned messages uh, button at the top to find the link so you can add your notes for the following meeting. And if you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. And when you do that, it's super helpful if it's uh, you know something that somebody can just read cold that they don't have to make a lot of interpretation of that. But um, anyway, the structure of this meeting, we're going to have five parts after this introduction. We're going to take a look at uh, the community news, which is a set of items from the Python on Microcontrollers e-newsletter. Next up after that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a quantitative overview of the whole project, a chance to look at the numbers separate from our individual updates. And then come the participatory parts. The third part is hug reports, an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. That can be on uh, Discord, on GitHub, on the Adafruit forums, or just on the internet at large. The fourth part is status updates, it's the opportunity for anyone to report on what they've been up to, uh, moving the status of CircuitPython forward. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week or since you had a chance to catch up with us and what you hope to get up to over the uh, next week or in the near future. And then the final part, if we need it, is called In the Weeds. If we need a more long form discussion about things, uh, whether this emerges from status updates or something that you have identified ahead of time, this is the place for it. And that covers how the meeting will go. And uh, so next up, we will start with community news. I've picked just a couple of Python related news stories uh, or stories from the uh, newsletter. And number one is a little project called EcoEDA, Recycling E-Waste During Electronics Design in KiCad. And this is a Python based tool that integrates with KiCad and is designed to provide suggestions of recycled components whenever you add a new symbol to your schematic. Next up, Python tops yet another rankings list. Uh, and this is a link to a real news article uh, published in uh, ABC Australia. Python snake meat could become a super protein on dinner plates in years to come, research suggests. A study, pounded, uh, a study published in the Nature Journal has found the meat to be highly efficient, environmentally friendly source of nutrition that can be raised on waste proteins. And then back to serious stuff for a moment. The Adafruit IO in 2024 survey Last Chance is coming up. Inspired by Scott's blog post, CircuitPython 2024, the Adafruit IO developers and designers are requesting feedback from you to help guide development of Adafruit IO in 2024. It's wrapping up soon, so please respond. There's a link to the Adafruit blog, which says, if you're a current Adafruit free IO user or an Adafruit Plus paid user, or have previously used IO in the last year, we want to hear from you. And uh, there's a lot more in the newsletter. The Python and Microcontrollers weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, 
Python and MicroPython developments. You are invited to contribute your own edits, whether it's uh, news that you ran across or a project of your own. And you can do that on GitHub. There's a link in the notes document and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also email cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X. And next up, we have the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. We have our lovely Adabot run a report covering seven days of contribution information, and that runs in the early hours of the morning uh, US Eastern time. So changes that occurred today are not included in this report. And I will do the overall section and then ask some other Adafruit folks to take up some individual sections below. So overall, we saw 33 pull requests merged by 18 authors and eight reviewers. So thanks to all of those people. Uh, among the authors, there are some names that are less familiar to me. We have uh, U-R-E, Yuri, Kyle Moore, uh, Anonymous Cowhead is back. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, Fabian Chuteau is a newer name for me. SAK917 and XS5871, uh, I also don't recognize. Uh, and issues-wise, we saw 29 closed issues by 13 people and 16 opened by 12 people. So it's really nice to see uh, those large numbers of people involved. And it's always nice when the net number of issues edges down a little bit. And with that, I will ask Scott to uh, go over the numbers for the core. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. OK, for the core, we had 20 pull requests merged from 12 different authors, which is awesome. C. Darius, Fabian Chateau, URE, SAC917, Kyle Moore, Sean the IT Guy, XS5871, and Badlock B are all infrequent authors, so thanks to those folks. Uh, for reviewers, we had six reviewers. Uh, Blitz City DIY, Retired Wizard, and Anecdata are all infrequent reviewers, so thanks to them. Uh, we had 24 open pull requests, so we're just under the 25 single page goal that I have for us. Um, issues wise, we had 14 closed issues by 8 people and 14 opened by 11 people, so we're net zero, which is great. And we also have nearly signal digits on both opening and closing, which is awesome. We have a total of 672 open issues. Uh, we have 9 active milestones. Uh, these are used to prioritize work by Adafruit funded folks. Um, if you have other issues that you'd like to work on, uh, don't be afraid if they're long term. We'd, we're happy to help uh, shepherd changes that people want to see. Uh, but these are the priorities for Adafruit funded folks. So we have four open issues for 9.0.x. These are like small uh, fixes to the latest stable release, 9.0. Uh, we have zero open issues for 8.2x, which we could probably close at this point. I think we're feeling good about 9.0 well enough to close 8.2x. Um, we have one open issue for 9.1.0, which will be the next uh, feature release. Um, and then we have 29 open issues for 9xx, which are other things that we pegged to do between before 10. Um, and we have two issues not assigned to milestone, so we do have some triage to do, although that may have been done between when this uh, these stats were grabbed and uh, and when I'm reading them off now. All right, thank you, Scott. Next up, I'd like to invite Tim to tell us about the libraries. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this section covers the CircuitPython libraries, all of which can be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. Um, across all of those libraries this week, we had uh, eight pull requests merged by six authors. The uh, name that was there that stuck out to me as newer or less familiar was Ven1953. Uh, the other names there are folks that I see more frequently on this list. So thanks to them as well and Ven1953 this week. Uh, we had uh, four reviewers, also um, relatively usual suspects on reviewers. Thanks to Melissa, Scott, Tectric, and Dan. Um, all the pull requests this week were just one day old, relatively light week, all uh, brand new ones. That leaves us after the week with 72 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest one, I believe, is a draft one at 592 days, and the newest one uh, is actually two days old, which is interesting. Uh, usually that shows one day. Um, we had, over the past seven days, 13 issues that were closed by six people, with two new issues opened up by two people. 
That leaves us with 730 open issues across all these libraries. And of those, uh, we're down to five of them that are labeled as good first issues. You can find those five as well as all the other open issues and PRs over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is where you should head if you are interested in getting involved in the project. Um, if you want to start out with uh, reviewing, that's usually a pretty good spot. Over on that contributing page, you'll find a list of all the open PRs. You can take a look through those. Uh, if you've got hardware for any of them, you can test it out. Otherwise, you can just have a look at the code and the syntax, spelling, uh, et cetera. Leave a comment letting us know that you took a look and what you found. Once you get comfortable with that, we can um, get you leveled up to leave official reviews over on GitHub. If you like to uh, get more involved on the coding side of things than reviewing, you can also view a list of open issues over on that contributing page. Uh, the open issues are issues that have been created on GitHub. Uh, so if you would like to try to tackle one of those, you can identify one that you've got hardware for or an, a particular interest in um, and go try to you know code up whatever change is mentioned in the issue and submit a PR uh, with that change. The page does have a drop down near the top that allows you to filter those, which is how you can pull out uh, those good first issues if you'd like, or search uh, by one of a few other filters that are there. Um, we do have guides uh, for contributing to Git and GitHub. If you need help, we also have folks available on the Discord. So um, just let us know if you're trying to contribute uh, and having trouble. Um, just let us know on the Discord. We're always going to be happy to help folks get spun up with uh, contributing, whether it's reviewing or contributing code or whatever. We want everyone to be able to contribute in whatever ways they can. Um, in Library PyPI weekly download stats this week, we had 151,767 downloads across the 325 libraries on PyPI. Uh, the top tens list is here in the notes doc if you'd like to check those out. And then for new and updated libraries in the last seven days, uh, uh, there is a new eHttp server, which is a, a different variation of HTTP server that was added to the community bundle, uh, which looks really interesting. And then the uh, RSA library was updated with some new examples. And that's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. Thank you. And to round out this section, Melissa, would you like to give us the stats on Blinka? Yes, uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single port computers. And let's see, I lost my place on here. Ah, oh, here it is. The text is like smaller than the other ones. Uh, so uh, this week we had five pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. Uh, leaving a net of four open pull requests amongst other repositories, which is definitely less than uh, I normally am reading off. Uh, there were two closed issues by one person and zero open by zero people, leaving a net of 84 open issues. There were 15,121 PyPI downloads in the last week, 12,031 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 132 supported boards. And that is it. All right. Thank you to all three of you for going through that information for us. And now we're ready to move on to Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, then we'll go down the notes document in the order that folks are there. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So um, I want to start with a group hug, but then thank Melissa for her patience as I worked on a PR about absolute image links on circuitpython.org. And uh, shortly before the meeting, Toddbot dropped a cool demo on Mastodon. There is a video, and I think that uh, Tim or somebody is going to put the link in the, in the channel if you want to check that out. But otherwise, um, you can find that link in the notes document. Um, all right, next up is Anecdata. Hello. or I can just read it out. Um, happy to. Uh, Anecdata has a hug for me for ongoing work on SSL and server-side stuff like SO Reuse Adder. Uh, next we have Dan, and then I have notes to read from Devin. Okay, uh, thanks to Bill ADAT, who was trying the main branch and noticed that the tags, there was something odd when setting up the ESP IDF 
environment that it got the version wrong, and that turned out to be due to some tagging problems with our um, fork of their repo. So that was noticed and easily fixed. And then thanks to Anecdata and Mikhail Pukusa and DJ Devon and Retired Wizard and some other people, there have been many, who are doing a lot of testing on network issues. There's a lot of discussion in um, Discord and also in a few different issues on uh, GitHub. And that's really helpful for people to kind of pin down what's really going wrong. Okay. All right, next I have the notes from DJ Devon 3. Uh, coming up after that, though, is Tim, Foamy Guy. So DJ Devon 3 writes a hug for studio staff, Anecdata, Dan H., and Jepler for working together to fix a bug that prevented the RP2040 from starting HTTP server. The fix by Jepler was rolled into 9.1.0. Uh, a hug for Justin for his continued work on connection manager and rough linting. Also, a thank you for the quick PR involving Connection Manager with HTTP Server. A hug for Snaky Maker Cat for starting a port for the Electrosmith Daisy Seed. After looking into it more, they figured out it has 8 megabytes of flash, so it could be a pretty nice CircuitPython port. A hug to Kmatch for the excellent Learn Guide on Memory Saving Tips. It was a nice quick reference for using MemFree to track resource usage. Hugs for Toddbot, Anecdata, Deshapu, El Pekenen, Foamy Guy, Tyeth, and many others for answering questions in the Help with CircuitPython Discord channel. A hug to Sean, who is a relative newcomer to our Discord. They're doing a custom ESP32 board port, parallel display project, and helping others with display-related questions from the experience they've gained. A hug for Michael Pokusa for starting to port HTTP server examples to Connection Manager. A couple of hugs to Foamy Guy, the first for recommending Windows Task Scheduler to keep CircuitPython stubs updated, as well as for the new outlined label for display text. It works very well. And that brings us to uh, Foamy Guy and then to Katni. All right, thank you. Um, hug reports for me this week. Thanks to DJ Devon3 for diving into typing in some of the libraries, as well as submitting. A new feature for the IS31FL uh, something 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 that I don't remember library that's a matrix LED display driver. Um, thanks to Dan H for sharing a PDF copy and uh, the idea of checking uh, on archive.org to find a, a learn guide page uh, that got deleted when I tried to use a rollback to the earlier state functionality uh, while I was slightly panicking trying to figure out how to get it back. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, thank you to Jeff and Maker Melissa for improvements to the way that the images are included in the RSS feed on circuitpython.org and a uh, group hug. Thanks. All right. And after Katni is Maker Melissa, but go ahead, Katni. Hello. Uh, so Hi. first, my hug is for uh, Tyef for talking grow light setups with me and for answering an Adafruit IO question. It's been so long since I've actually used the dashboard to... Um, to track data that I couldn't remember whether I needed a single feed for individual things or so on and so forth, and that got answered really quickly. Uh, to Foamy Guy for working on interactive software for my conference badge, and a group hug to my Pi Ohio organizers team for being an amazing group of folks. That's what I got. All right, thanks. Melissa, you're up next, and then I've got some notes to read. Okay, I just want to give a hug to you, Jeff and Dan, for uh, your quick responsiveness with the circuitpython.org updates and group hugging to everyone else. All right, I have notes from Snaky Maker Cat, and then we'll go to Scott. Uh, but first, Snaky Maker Cat says, Hug to DJ Devon3 for being patient while I dig through the Daisy Seed guts. I know he is dying to test CircuitPython on the new board. And a group hug. And for once, Scott, you're not rounding out the section, but you are next. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Toddbot, for uh, rounding out just a, a, in just a minute. Uh, first, I have a hug to Dan for figuring out Bill 88T's issue that I hadn't pushed tags to the Adafruit ESP IDF. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, and then thanks to uh, TAC for working on DNet for TinyUSB for me. I know there's a lot going on in TinyUSB land, and it's really helpful when he uh, lets me interrupt him and, and kind of co-opt his time for a little bit. So I really appreciate that. All right, and the notes from Toddbot say, Group hug. Thanks for all the CircuitPython work. It's so fun to hack on. A hug specifically for me for bitmap filter. I'm starting to play with it now for non-photo uses. To uh, Creer, Tanut, Dan H, 
et al. for getting Parallel Bus working and enabled for ESP32. These fast displays on fast processors are super nice. And that concludes Hug Reports, so we will move on to status updates. It's time to tell folks what we're up to individually. Uh, I'll start and then we'll go through the notes document once again. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. And uh, this is a great time to provide a quick tip or trick, uh, but if a discussion is gonna become long, then we want to move it to in the weeds. So with that gentle reminder, I will get started. Um, last week, I wrote a learn guide, the first that I had written in a while. I um, used an RP2040 with uh, the, the, the Feather RP2040 DVI to create a DVI converter for a particular vintage computer, and I used CircuitPython to do it. Uh, so that guide is live on learn.adafruit.com and was the 3,000th guide published on Learn, which is an amazing number. Um, what I'm doing other than that is working on updates to the floppy I.O. module and the Adafruit floppy circuit Python package. That is mostly done. Uh, there's just one problem with PIO capture of flux that I need to get back to, and I'm hoping that with the fresh eyes of taking like five days off from it uh, to do other stuff, that I will just see that and fix it, but you never know. And that's what I am going to be up to. Next up is Dan, then I'll have some notes to read from DJ Devon 3. Okay, um, so uh, last week was uh, three circuit Python releases, 901 with some fixes, 902, which was a single a point release to make to fix a missing pin on a single board, uh, which was just being introduced, and also 910 beta 0, which includes a bunch of development changes uh, working toward 910. Um, so there'll probably be a 903. Um, and related to that, uh, there was a problem with analog in on uh, NRF boards, so that I fixed that in the 90X branch. Um, as mentioned, I updated tags uh, to fix a problem, uh, a build problem when you're using the main branch. That was really simple. Uh, I'm kind of watching over some testing of Wi-Fi stuff that's going on and to see at what point I need to start doing some uh, deeper debugging in the core of what's going wrong with some Wi-Fi stuff. But I appreciate everybody who's working on that. And otherwise, I just have a long list of um, uh, 90X and 9XX issues to work on. Also, over the weekend, I did a bunch of um, editing, like fix them really simple like typos and stuff and a bunch of learn guides. And I will continue to do that when I get bored. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, I have notes from DJ Devon 3 Submitted a PR for HTTP server that uses connection manager for the socket pool. The idea was well received and it was decided all examples with socket pool will use connection manager going forward. So that's a thing now, we're full steam ahead with connection manager ported my multiplexed seven segment display project to 9.0. Didn't run into any HT16K33 library issues. It pulls six different APIs sequentially, so it's a pretty good torture test for socket reuse. It works great on an S3, but on the S2, it throws an ESP IDF memory error. I tracked the memory error as far back as 8.0 beta, then handed my findings over to the devs. The Mastodon API example I submitted two weeks ago is already broken as Mastodon revamped their API this week and deprecated a lot of endpoints. It only required minor changes in the URL and endpoints to get it working again. Seems like they're moving towards OAuth 2.0, so it's probably just a matter of time before they completely deprecate their publicly opened version 1 API. And wrote a playground note on automating pip and CircuitPython stubs updates for Windows by creating a task scheduler bash script. Uh, so check out the Adafruit Playground for that. The next up we have Foamy Guy again. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, last week I updated some learn guide, both code uh, code in the repo and some pages um, that reference different bits of code but aren't checked into the repo for some of the updates to display I.O. in 9.0, but we decided uh, to change the way that those warnings work and the timing of the deprecation 
um, and how that rollout will go. So those will sit uh, as draft for now until we're ready. And then I did go back through the guide pages to change them back uh, to how they were originally. Uh, and I also saved off a list of URLs this time. So when it is time to make that switch, um, we can actually just click through that list instead of searching through them again, which will save a fair amount, uh, amount of time when the when the time does come. Um, I soldered up a Grove Featherwing and a Feather S3 TFT reverse um, with the intention, they're, they're, they've got some pins that are kind of backwards compared to how uh, most normal feathers are, but I soldered them up that way so that the uh, they could be used back to back with um, the Grove plugs on one side and the display on the other side uh, inside of a, a Simon type game that I would like to make inside of a cardboard box. Um, my feather does have a dead TFT, so I've got to get a new one. Um, but uh, everything else did fit together how I had imagined, and the uh, the buttons work how I was imagining. So uh, once I get the new um, device, I think I will be good to go on that, at least as far as what I have planned. Um, I updated the, the display text learn guide to include some new sections for the two new types of labels, outline label and scrolling label. Both of those I created at some point after that guide was written and it was never updated to include them, so now they're there. Uh, I updated um, the PyCharm page specifically that's in, I think it's in the Welcome to Circuit Python guide. There's like an advanced, uh, an advanced page and then PyCharm is one of the sub pages there. I updated that to include information about the new uh, device specific board stub, so how you can enable that um, onto that page. And then uh, lastly, I've been working on a tic-tac-toe game that runs on the e-ink display for a Badger 2040 uh, W. Uh, most recently, the bits that I added were checking for the winners uh, at the end of the game, or really checking for the winner after every turn, and then drawing a line through the winning pieces if there was a winner found. Uh, currently, it draws correctly, but it does need some some help still because it refreshes the display a bunch of extra times, and it also doesn't remove the line when it's time to start the next game. So uh, it's close, but still needs some tinkering. And that's what I have got. Thanks. Thank you. And next up is Katni, followed by Maker Melissa. All right, so I finished up the software for my Growlite setups. There are currently three different versions uh, because I ended up needing to mount the controller in an opposite orientation on one terrarium. Um, and there's another one running a, there's only one running a sensor. So three different versions of the software. Um, I eventually figured out where to mount the other three, but it required rewiring the level shifter. So the connector was coming out the opposite side of the um, feather sandwich. The difference in the code on the other three is that one's currently running the temperature and humidity sensor out inside the terrarium. I'm only running one at the moment to compare to one that I have outside the terrarium to see if there's any point in adding it into the other setups or whether the climate inside is identical to ambient. So far it seems the LEDs increase the temperature in the terrarium during the day, but it's basically identical at night. That said, watching the humidity spike after watering and seeing how long it remains high is at least interesting, so that may be enough reason to add um, sensors to the others. Uh, the one with the sensor displays the date, sensor data, and what the manual LED status is, which is to say the, the whether or not I turned the LEDs on or off using a button um, on the controller. And the ones without sensors um, display the date and LED status only. My wife designed a 3D printed case for the controllers that mounts to the terrariums using magnets. It's a really slick design and it worked incredibly well for my needs. Um, we're, we're finishing up a case for the sensor to allow airflow, but avoid directly misting the sensor board when watering the plants. It looks really neat so far, but we need to test it to make sure whether the make sure the airflow is enough. After that, we're designing a case for the Badger 2040W uh, with uh, that is going to be running the code that Tim was talking about. Um, for me, the case um, I added. Uh, NeoPixels to mine by soldering three wires of a STEM QT cable to it and using the quick port on the Badger to connect them. The NeoPixels are about the same height as the Badger, so I'm going to add them um, into the case along the left side of the board. Um, and then completely unrelated, I'm not sure I shared this here, but I agreed to be conference chair for Pi Ohio 2024, um, which is where my hug report to my organizing team came from. It is an incredible amount of work, um, but I have an amazing team of people helping me. So uh, hopefully I can get everything going in time um, and uh, within budget. Um, but it's been an incredible learning experience and uh, I'm very excited uh, to be doing that. So if you are in the area and or um, wanna come out, it's uh, July 27th and 28th, I think, um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Anyway, that's what I've got. Thank you. 
And next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, so I added the new boards to circuitpython.org that were uh, added to circuitpython 9.1 beta and uh, fixed compiler warnings in some Arduino libraries. I fixed some small issues in a couple of the circuitpython libraries. I updated the magic storybook guide with uh, or this magic storybook with chat GBT guide with, for bookworm and uh, the latest OP, open AI API and I'll probably update the chat GPT bear project to bookworm next and that's for a minute. Thank you. Next I have notes from Snakey Maker Cat who writes, I started working a few weeks ago on the CircuitPython port to the Daisy Seed, a really cool STM32 board but ran into the 128 KB internal flash issue early on. Luckily, there is an 8 megabyte chip external flash and 65 megabytes of RAM that makes the project totally worth the effort. Unfortunately, the documentation from Electrosmith is not great, especially since they went closed source recently, and the only available config file for the flash chip contains plenty of mistakes. So at the moment, I'm working, I'm working on an STM cube IDE project and digging through data sheets to figure out the right configurations for the MCU and how to use the QSPY flash in XIP mode. It's easier to test all that in the ST work environment. I'm sure I will get to the actual CircuitPython part soon. And this time, Scott, you do get to finish the section. So uh, what's <laughs> up? So uh, I'm giving a Pi Cascades talk next weekend. Um, it's mostly done. They actually wanted slides yesterday, which I <laughs> didn't realize until Wednesday evening last week. So I was doing a lot of work on my podcast Cades talk on Thursday and Friday. So thanks to Deep Divers for working through them with me and, and giving feedback. Um, I do have some bugs to file for the mobile app, so I'm going to try to do that today as well. Um, and then after that, I'm back to the USB host Featherwing work. Um, I tried to show it on show and tell on Wednesday and saw that there was a bug, and I figured it out soon after that. But um, I had the console UART set up for CircuitPython debugging, and but the like input serial stream was just floating pin, which meant that like any sort of noise that I generated was causing random inputs to CircuitPython, um, which it caused my demo to not work. So remember that if you're ever in a world where you're getting um, using the UART input into CircuitPython, make sure that your your RX pin or like the the data going into CircuitPython is uh, pulled down <laughs> uh, or up, whatever it should be for, for UART. Um, so you don't get just a random, bunch of random stuff in. All right, pro tip, tips from Scott. But next we have yeah. the section In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long form discussions. If you have any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things so we're not waiting around to see if anybody has topics. And we do have a topic from Dan, so I will let you take it away. Okay, this topic came up in issue 9112 that's linked in the notes. Um, CircuitPython issue 9112. So the question is, um, right now, uh, well, it used to be that we would give um, Wi-Fi credentials in two variables in secrets.py, and then we switched that to settings.toml. And then um, very much because of the web workflow, uh, we decided that if two variables were used, uh, CircuitPy Wi-Fi SSID and CircuitPy Wi-Fi password, that um, we would auto connect to that uh, access point when CircuitPython started up. And if I'm correct, Scott, you can tell me yes or no, uh, that always happens, but the web workflow isn't started unless the CircuitPy Web API password is set. Uh, right. It used to it used to be that if you had the auto connect stuff, then the MDNS server and the HTTP server for the web workflow would start, um, and then you would just it would tell you that you needed to set the password. But people wanted to separate that out, so we've. We've tied the web workflow to the prevalent, the presence of the password now. And does the MDNS server start on AutoConnect or only when the password is present? I believe it's gated by the password too. I can okay, remember. all right. So the fact that AutoConnect occurs at all 
is um, it's not clear from the names, but you know they are kind of official sounding names. There was some discussion in examples of whether we wanted to give examples that use some other names to distinguish whether or not um, uh, you wanted to, you wanted autoconnect or not, or you could add a flag and use the same names and but suppress autoconnect by saying set CircuitPy Wi-Fi autoconnect to zero, or if we implemented booleans, which we don't have yet in settings.toml to set it to false. Um, so I think we have some kind of varying uh, uh, ideas on this. And I think the question is, what's clear? And should we document this somewhere? Should we think about changing the names in the long run to make it um, more obvious that autoconnect happens from the names? Like you could, they could names could be CircuitPy Wi-Fi password autoconnect or something like that. But that's a mouthful, and we'll have to change a whole lot of examples. Well, my kind of my intention was that the CircuitPy prefix meant that it was something that CircuitPy would do something based on. Yeah, yeah, and I understand that, but it's not. It's still you have to look up what it is, or you have to know. It's like it's not manifest from the name, so uh, it's not sort of uh, so. So yeah, the auto connect is. Yeah, the auto the, the yeah the word auto connect isn't there or something. It you is could put a comment in um, in document in, in settings.toml that says what you know like a tiny bit of documentation or something like that. And I was just wondering whether people have ideas about this and whether when auto connect happens it it screws them up or they like it. I, uh, I mean, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. It makes it go a little faster if you haven't enabled the web workflow, but I'm not sure what other, um, whether there are disadvantages for the autoconnect and whether people are even aware that autoconnect is happening. Also, I guess when you do a deep sleep, um, I don't know, does it, re, does it re auto connect when you wake up from deep sleep? I, mm -hmm. I don't even know the answer to that question. That, and that takes a while. So you don't really want to do that if you're just doing something simple. So uh, all those all those things make it a little complicated about it looks like it does. It will auto connect again for you, right? It will not start the workflow again. Okay, so that first link I posted is into this logic. So it does. It gets the SSID, it gets the password. If it can't get those, it returns. And if it can't get those, it calls connect. If it if it if connect doesn't work, then it just disables the radio and returns. Right. And then it gets the reset reason. Hmm. And oh, I guess deep sleep alarm. Reset reason doesn't equal deep sleep alarm, then return false. So I guess it will can it will start it will start the web workflow again after a deep sleep alarm. Okay. So those that means it's it's kind of expensive to wake up from deep sleep if these things are set. So, and then the question is like, right. so I noticed Foamy guy says in the comments that he likes auto connect because it's nice not to have to actually put a Wi-Fi dot radio dot connect in the user code and have to look up the environment variables. And I guess the question is like, well, what should be the standard boilerplate or not? And, and, you know, we could say like, okay, you can do a connect or if you do this, it will connect automatically. And it's sort of like there are definitely two use cases, and they're both kind of equally valid. So uh, I don't know if um, uh, so. David glowed the pet. It's the password. This is not the Wi-Fi password. This is a password that you have to type into the browser when you're using the web workflow. Well, we won't connect if there's no password. R right. That's it's a separate issue that's not related to this discussion. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, if if CircuitPy Wi-Fi password is not found. Oh, actually, no, if if it's not set at all, then it assumes there's that it's an open network. 
web API web API password or Wi-Fi password? Wi-Fi password. So you 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 yeah. can auto connect if you have an open number. Yeah, that makes sense. It's the web API password that I'm talking about. That it's really a different password completely. So, well, we're, yeah, for Wi-Fi password. Yeah. So my my response on the issue was. If people want to store Wi-Fi credentials but not have CircuitPython do anything with them, they should just use a different key. So I think the question is then in the examples, like we have examples all over the wazoo that say like, here's a sample test program to get you started right. with Wi-Fi. And what what should be the standard? Should the standard example use the auto-connect behavior or not? I think it should because I think web workflow is good. Okay. I think by default, people should have web workflow on. Okay. I have one quick observation about that. Um, when I hung out with JP a couple of weeks ago, he had brought his Memento camera and he wanted to take it out and make a quick snapshot of something. And this, th this could be down to his configuration. And in this case, you'd want to change it. But anytime he wanted to turn the camera on, he had to wait out the auto connect timeout of his Wi-Fi that he had previously configured. And that was not great, and but I don't know what the solution is to that because you do want to then connect to it on web workflow and and download a SD card image or whatever it is. So, um, in summary, I'm not sure what the solution is, but this is a pain point that I noticed someone having uh, with Memento specifically and web workflow or uh, Wi-Fi automatically Wi-Fi connecting at boot time. That's all. Right. Well, maybe right. for the Memento, is it, that's an example of something that's used in a portable environment a lot. So maybe that needs to be discussed in the appropriate guide or guide. Well, I think there's, I think there's optimizations that we could do. Um, that could make all of this faster. Like if there's a timeout that we have to wait for, then we could try to set the timeout lower. Um, we could also like. We could add a key that allows you to specify what channel the Wi-Fi is on, or we could automatically save it ourselves so that like we know what channel to start searching for. Because, like, yeah, and even I have a to do in here. Okay. <laughs> it says do our own scan so that we can find the channel we want before calling connect. Otherwise, connect will do a full slow scan to pick the best AP. Um. Yeah, you know, like there's, and there's, I think there, there are other possibilities like, there too. like asynchronously doing the Wi-Fi connect. I mean, I know some of the APIs allow you to initiate the connection and then get a call back. And that would be something we'd have to, you know, kind of take care of in the core. But it right. seems we like need to, we would need to add that internally. Right it, now. it could happen asynchronously compared to starting your code.py, potentially. It's probably tricky to do, but it, right. it's not impossible. Anybody else have something to say, or Dan, do you want to to say any no, wrap up I, to I, that? I don't heard. I can reach a conclusion, but I'm, I, I'm. This is. It's helpful that I got other input, or that everyone contributed to this discussion, and I and I see where everybody is coming from. If we assume web workflows enabled, do simple examples even need connect logic? I mean, maybe not. Maybe what when we write those examples, we say explicitly, because you set these things. CircuitPython will auto connect for you. Right. I think it should be, I, it needs to be better documented for sure. Yeah. Right now it's documented in the re, in readed docs, but not in the guides so much. Right. That's right. not so great. And I, we could also, it would take, it would use up bytes in the firmware, but we could, the default settings.toml could have information in it. Um, yeah. And that and that and the sample settings dot towels could also have that same like if you set these things it will auto connect and so and whenever anybody copies a sample one and edits it they'll know right away so right I, I'll kind of look at the guides and see if maybe if yeah something. um some nice asked uh, will Wi-Fi radio enabled equals false prevent auto connect it will not it's too late. It's too late because the auto connect happens before user code runs. Yeah. And then Anic Data says when connect logic is desired, do we want some pseudo standard settings.toml credentials to use and recommend? Yeah, I would I would do what you suggested, I think, Anic Data, which is Wi Fi SSID and Wi Fi password. 
Um, that's what I do in the... my own programs for what that's worth. Right. And there is, I think we do have some work on the web workflow side to work, like to do the reverse of like manually connect to Wi-Fi, but then turn on web workflow automatically. If like, maybe we don't want auto Wi-Fi connect, but we do want auto web workflow. So like if your user code does some more fancy logic for like multiple <laughs> SSIDs, if you're roaming, but you set in your settings.toml, like the API password, then maybe we should auto start web workflow after a manual connect. <laughs> I don't think that works either. Yeah, like that, that's may not, want not even work. an issue that says that. So maybe we need to open that issue. Right. So I, I can file an issue for that. OK. All right. Well, this is good. This is just what I wanted to get was, was a little bit of, of, uh, of brainstorming on this. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for that discussion and for everything else. I'm going to wrap up this meeting. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for April 1st, 2024. Thanks to everybody who participated. And just a reminder, we'd love it if you could support Adafruit and CircuitPython and folks like me who work on CircuitPython. And you can do that by purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held uh, Monday, April 8th, 2024, at the usual time of 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um... And that meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks again, everybody.